What's up guys, Andrew Bainey here, and on today's video, we're gonna be doing an FAQ style thing. I don't know where that accent came from, I'm sorry. So I haven't done one of these in a little while, but I wanted to because I have a couple things that I really wanna talk about, which are pretty strange and pretty big life events, I guess you could say depending on how you view it, I guess. So first and foremost, before we get started, for this video, I am picking questions both from my Facebook page and my Discord. Please go follow my Facebook page if you use Facebook. I am at very close to 10,000 followers on there, and I'm pretty sure once you hit 10,000 followers, you can enable monetization, which would obviously be amazing for me. You know, the more revenue streams I can get, the better. So if you're on Facebook, go follow my page. That's gonna be linked in the description and the pinned comment. And again, my Discord is the other place that I'm pulling these questions from, and that's also gonna be linked in the description below. So if you use Discord, go check out the Discord server. It's a lot of fun. And the third really quick thing I wanted to plug before we get started is also my band Carcosa has an official Facebook fan club as well. So again, if you're on Facebook, go join that. We will be doing another merch drop very, very soon. So this is your warning. If you want Carcosa merch, everyone in that Facebook group will get early access. So go check that out. And if you don't use Facebook, you can also sign up to our newsletter. So with that out of the way, the first thing I wanna talk about before I move on to the questions is fucking metal TikTok. Cause like what on earth is happening right now? Um, so believe it or not, I am now more well known on TikTok than YouTube, which is very weird because I've been doing YouTube for close to 10 years now and I've been doing TikTok for maybe a year and a half and not very well. I, I, if I'm being honest, like basically all I do is re-upload my YouTube clips to TikTok and for whatever reason, they just exploded over there. So I don't know what's going on but I have over 200,000 followers on TikTok now, and I have 170,000 subscribers on YouTube. That's crazy, that's super weird. And I understand, you know, TikTok's a little cringe, a lot of people don't like it, whatever, I get it. But you are 100% fooling yourself if you don't think that TikTok is a very important social media platform. If you have a band, or you're an artist or anything, and you're not on there, for real, go sign up. It is absolutely mind blowing how different it is to YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or anything really. Because again, some of the videos that I upload to YouTube will get like, let's say 10,000 views, but on TikTok, they can get over a million for the exact same video. Almost everyone who follows me on TikTok has no idea that I'm a YouTuber and has probably never ever seen me before. In fact, if you literally look at the analytics, on TikTok, it is 60% female, 40% male, and I'm pretty sure the age range is closer to like 15 to 25 as my primary demographic. And on YouTube, it's literally 98% male to 2% female, and the target audience is like 25 to 40 or something. So it's like a completely different audience. Again, that's why it's so important to diversify, not even diversify your content. Like I said, I post the same things in both places, but diversify your audience, I guess would be a better way to put it. Anyways, I'm rambling. I know you guys probably don't care about TikTok, but I am very happy with this. And I think it's gonna be the start of something pretty cool for my uh, career, I guess. So we'll see what happens next. Hopefully I don't start doing flossing or, or twerking or something, but we'll see. Okay, so with that out of the way, moving on to your guys' questions. Number one question comes from Brando Baggins over on Facebook, and he says, what would you recommend for newer bands trying to get traction in the online metal scene? Well, I mean, the thing I just mentioned is definitely TikTok. Uh, that is like a huge up and coming market that a lot of metal heads and metal bands are not utilizing at all right now because metal heads think it's cringe so they don't want to use it. And again, I get it, but hey, in my opinion, you're lost, you know? So that's number one is post on TikTok and literally everywhere, like get your content on as many platforms as you can. Um, in theory, the best way to do it would be to make exclusive content for each platform. So, you know, people have an excuse or a reason to follow you everywhere. And in terms of the context of a band, this concept honestly works pretty similarly. Again, some bands absolutely kill it on Instagram or Facebook, but their YouTube views are super low. So again, just diversifying your content and getting as much out there as possible. Um, I know another big one is also paying a lot of attention to Spotify. This is another one that's controversial for whatever reason, like people like to complain about Spotify and I kind of get it, but Again, uh, Spotify playlists are incredibly important. So if you can find any way to get on some Spotify playlists, 
that will be super beneficial to you as well. Next question comes from Corgan Slenderman and they ask, what is your favorite tuning slash guitar at the moment? So I've said this many times before, I'm pretty sure, but my three favorite tunings are drop A, drop C, and drop E. And I kind of have a favorite guitar for each tuning. Uh, so my favorite guitar right now is still probably my custom Carcosa Aristides 8-string, which is tuned to drop E and literally fucks up my camera lens because it's so bright. So this is probably my favorite. Um, and then number two, no surprise here, would probably also be my other Aristides. This one was a wedding present from my friends. It's upside down, but on the headstock there, you can see it says string gauge because my friends are very funny. But yeah, they gave this to me as a wedding present. So this obviously has a ton of sentimental value and is also an amazing guitar. And then for drop C, I kind of alternate between two guitars, either this one right here, which is the Balaguer, uh, what is this? The Balaguer Archetype, I think it's called. And this one is set up for drop C slash drop B. And I also have another one over there, which is a Fast Guitars Roamer, which is like a Jazzmaster style six string. And that's also floating around C or B. So these are probably my four guitars I use the most, I would say. Next question comes from Tatang Sutarman. I am very sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Uh, and they ask headless guitar or not headless. I've had a few headless guitars over the years, but I personally find that I usually gravitate towards going with a normal headstock guitar. Proof being, I think I literally have like 25 guitars right now, maybe more and none of them are headless. So I guess it's safe to say that I prefer headed to headless. Darian DeLami says Gream. That's right, baby, Gream. Justice Gash asks, how are you enjoying using real amps versus plugins in the room feel especially? So you guys might've noticed this on a few of my recent videos, but I kind of went a little crazy and bought a bunch of actual tube amps. I don't really know why I did this because I've been pretty happy with plugins or Kempers or modelers for pretty much my entire life, but real tube amps were never something that I personally got into. And I don't know, I kind of figured like I have so many guitars now, like what's another rabbit hole I can go down to spend all my money. So I decided to go with amps. Um, so I've been enjoying it quite a lot. I've had, I don't even know how many amps I have now. I have an Engel Fireball, a Mesa Dual Rectifier 100 watt, an EVH 5150 350 watt, a Rev Generator 100P, a Rev G20, and then I also had a Hughes & Kettner Grandmeister 40 for a little bit, but I ended up returning it because I actually didn't like it that much. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's definitely very different to playing through a modeler, which I had always seen people say online, and I never understood why. But now that I finally have played around with it and have been able to actually record an amp properly, it does definitely give you a little bit different of a feel. Do I think it is like a game changer and way better than plugins? Not necessarily, like I still use my Fortin, or sorry, my Neural DSP plugins honestly just as much as my real amps anyways. I just like to have it because it kind of is a little easier to make a more unique guitar tone because it's a physical object and it's nice to be able to twist, pull and turn knobs. It's nice to be able to put pedals in front and it's a little easier to get a little bit more unique of a tone, I guess you could say. And it's something that feels a little bit more like you rather than a plugin, which, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have and can easily just click a preset. So I don't know, I'm torn on the thing. Like I use it both ways. I still use the Fortin Nameless Suite probably 50 to 60% of the time. And the other 40, I'm using one of my amps. Next question comes from John Tolman, and they ask, how was your experience with Doom Eternal, The Ancient Gods part two, if you've played it? So I still have not actually beat the game because I've been so incredibly busy lately, uh, especially with doing all of those Doom covers. Like I literally play, or did all those covers before I even started playing the game more or less. I did get to the final level in the game, which is Emora, which is the cover I just released. Go check it out, by the way. And I got to the part where there's two Marauders and a cursed demon. And I just stopped playing for the day because I was like, holy shit, this is really fucking hard. I also want to point out, it's embarrassing, but I am incredibly bad at the Doom games. I know that that is probably unforgivable because I'm, I guess, known as like the Doom cover guy now, but I'm actually really bad at the game. I can only beat the game on like the easiest difficulty. And yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know, man, that game is hard as fuck. It's super fun and I love it but it is very hard and very stressful. I don't know how anyone plays that game on Ultra Nightmare or whatever the hardest difficulty is called, cause like, it's a clusterfuck, but it's a great game. 
and an amazing soundtrack, obviously. Next question comes from Doge Plays Guitar. Yo, what is that tone and signal chain for the Imora cover? Because that tone has replaced my blood in my body. So Doge, I love that channel, man, it's so funny. Um, they are referring to my latest cover, which again was Imora from the Doom Eternal soundtrack. And again, that tone was actually incredibly easy to make. It's literally the Fortin Nameless Suite by Neural DSP. It's entirely just that plugin and nothing else. So it's my nine string guitar going straight into that. All of my Doom covers forever have always been the Fortin Nameless Suite. So if you like that guitar tone, go download that plugin. I think it's like a hundred bucks and it's one of my favorite plugins of all time. Next question comes from Tundrabolt and they ask, what is your favorite breakdown? So I was thinking about this. There's definitely a few that come to mind, but I think my favorite breakdown of all time is still to this day, a song called I'm So Tired of Sighing, Please Lord Let It Be Night. Super long song name by the amazing band Black Tongue, huge homies of mine. I think that that is the heaviest breakdown ever known to mankind. I still to this day haven't heard anything that I think is heavier than it. And Black Tongue as a whole is just like, also in my opinion, the heaviest band of all time. So if you haven't heard Black Tongue yet, do yourself a favor, go listen to their entire discography and your brain will be pummeled by stupidly, stupidly heavy breakdowns and you'll love it, trust me. Next question comes from Doomslayer. What do you think of getting really cheap gear around $100 to $200 range and modding it along the way instead of just saving up and getting good quality gear? So I also see this question all the time and there isn't really a straightforward answer to this because it really depends on your life situation. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, like obviously I didn't have all this stuff when I was starting out. Again, I've been doing YouTube and playing guitar for like 10 to 15 years now. So obviously when I started out, I didn't have good gear and it didn't really matter for me. Like I just made do with what I had. I think I used to have like, my first seven string was just the cheapest Ibanez seven string, which back then was still like $600 because seven strings were like weren't popular back then. And then over time I just modded it. I put in like new pickups and you know, learned better string gauges and stuff like that. So I don't think there's anything wrong with getting a cheap guitar and just modding it as you go, especially in the beginning. I see a lot of people get a little too obsessed with gear right from the get-go. Like, a lot of people don't even start a YouTube channel or a band because they have this like perfect idealistic vision of the exact sound that they want and they can't get it because, you know, obviously they can't drop like $3,000 on the most expensive gear, which is completely understandable and you shouldn't have to and you definitely shouldn't think that way. Some of the most popular videos on YouTube of all time have the worst guitar tones of all time. Some of my most popular videos are my worst sounding mixes. Like it really doesn't matter. As long as the idea is good or the video is cool, your gear doesn't necessarily matter. And you would be very surprised what you can get away with with way less money nowadays, especially compared to like when I started. But for example, like Brand of Sacrifice, I'm pretty sure they literally recorded their entire album using a $100 Scarlett 2i2 interface and that's it. So it's just a, a guitar plugged into that and then a plug-in. Like there's no real amps, no pedals, no nothing. That's it. Super easy. So that entire setup, I don't know how much his guitar is, but the you know interface and the plug-in probably cost like 200 bucks combined. And that album is going to be one of the best deathcore albums of 2021. So just saying, you don't need a ton of money to make something sound great necessarily. Okay, next question comes from Ghost Pixel, and they ask, what is your favorite video that you made or how did you feel after how to get signed to Rise Records gains so much traction? So this is also a tough one because obviously I make like two to three videos almost every single week. I think that my two, the two that come to mind right away, well, I guess there's three that come to mind right away. Number one is probably the playing metal in public video because that video sucked so much to make. It was so embarrassing, but the reaction from it made it all worth it. It made all the work and all the embarrassment worth it because people loved that video, which is awesome because I kind of didn't like doing it, but it made it much more rewarding in the end. Um, number two is actually the Meshuggah Guitar Riff Evolution video because again, that video was incredibly challenging to make and Johnny and I slaved away at that for, you know, like I think we did that all in like 10 hours straight, but it was like super fucking hard. And the thing with YouTube that's weird is like, or not even YouTube, with everything, is usually the videos that have the least amount of effort somehow do the best. 
but I was really happy in that case because that video took a lot of effort and it still did well, which unfortunately doesn't happen very often. So my favorite videos are always the ones that I put a lot of effort into that also do well. Because again, most of the time that's not the case, unfortunately. And as for the how to get signed to Rise Records video, that was so long ago, but that was my first ever viral video. Uh, so obviously I still hold that close to my heart because that's essentially the thing that made me take YouTube seriously. Because up until that point, I was doing YouTube like just for fun and you know, I'd be like, oh, whatever, I'm getting like 100 to 200, 1,000 views on each video. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's cool that people watch, but I didn't really think anything of it. And then when that video went viral, I was like, oh shit, maybe this could actually be a thing. And that's the first time I kind of started even remotely thinking like, oh, YouTube could maybe be an actual career. And it took like eight years, but we got there eventually. Next question is from D. What is your favorite Doom song? I think my favorite Doom song is BFG 10K. Next question is from Synth Chris, and they ask, are you planning on doing any more baritone kit builds? Last one turned out pretty sick. Um, I don't really have any plans at this point in time. I'm really happy with how that kit came out, but I honestly have barely used it yet just because I don't really use baritone guitars that often. Most of the time, for whatever reason, I just end up grabbing an eight string instead. Like if I want to tune to drop E, I'm probably going to grab an eight string instead of a baritone guitar, which doesn't really make sense because I don't even use these high three or four strings. But for whatever reason, I'm just more comfortable on an eight. Next question comes from CSP and they ask, I'm noticing a lot of metal YouTubers are getting shafted by the algorithm. Are you still able to hold an okay living from YouTube? And also, where can I get that mouse pad? Well, first and foremost, let's answer the most important part of that question, which is the mouse pad. I see a lot of people asking about this uh, beautiful mouse pad right here. So this is from an anime called Overlord, which I honestly actually haven't even really watched. And uh, that character is called Albedo, I believe. So the story behind this is I got it for Christmas as a joke gift because I thought it would be funny to have like a distractingly big titty anime girl mouse pad. I think Ola England has one as well and I thought it was funny. So I just thought like, hey, I'll do the same thing. And it's really funny because it's ended up being one of the most commented things on all of my videos now. Uh, so, hey man, it just goes to show like thro throwing little things in the background to get viewers attention for whatever reason works. And that's really why I did this. I do watch anime, mind you. I love anime, you know, like fucking almost all of my tattoos are based off of animes. Just this particular one I didn't necessarily watch. Um, literally, if you just go on Amazon and search anime mouse pad, it's just all big titty anime girl mouse pads. So I just like picked a random one from that. It's, there's nothing really more to it than that, to be honest with you. Um, and as for your serious part of the question regarding YouTubers making money, uh, yes, I am still making a very good living. Uh, I'm by no means like rich or anything like that. Although it uh, probably seems like I am because of all my stuff, but you gotta keep in mind like, Almost all of this stuff was either like free or heavily discounted, which I'm very grateful for. If I was buying all of this out of my own pocket, I would have not even close to this much stuff because I would not be able to afford that. So you gotta keep that in mind. Um, but as for actually making a living on YouTube, yes, I'm still making a good living. Uh, I'm happy to say that as of 2020, I actually made more money from being self-employed than I was making at my full-time job, which was very surprising to me. So I'm really glad that I made this leap and it seems like it's the right decision. And this year so far, I'm on track to make even more money than last year. So yeah, it's going well. I mean, it's tricky because like, I know people see the view counts on my videos and I understand that they're not impressive. You know, like my videos usually only get like 10 to 20K max, sometimes less than 10K. And yes, that's not like a ton of views, but the thing is, I'm making two to three videos every single week. And also, since I'm making so many videos, I'm also consistently generating revenue from my huge back catalog of videos. So that stuff all adds up to be like a significant amount. But the other really important thing is, it's really not about YouTube in some ways. Like, I think the actual ad revenue from YouTube only makes up maybe like 50% of my total revenue. And then the rest is from Patreon. Again, a huge thank you to anyone who supports me on Patreon because that's a massive help. And then another big part is sponsorship deals, which I get, you know, when a video is sponsored by so-and-so company, that always pays me. And those pay like way more than any ad revenue ever would. So that's why it's so important to have those sponsored ads. I know some people don't really like them and find them annoying and like, hey, 
I get it, I understand. It can be a little annoying to see, but please bear in mind the reason that those are there is because if those were not there, I probably would not be making enough money to be self-employed, to be completely honest with you. So it's a combination of Patreon, ad revenue, sponsored ads, and then I have all of my music on Spotify and Apple Music. That also adds another big chunk. I sell merch, sort of. That's like a very small chunk, but nonetheless. Uh, I also do, I work like a very part-time job, like an hour a day answering emails for a company. So I have like, you know, six to eight different sources of revenue. And some of them only pay like, you know, $100 and some of them pay thousands of dollars. But when you add that all together, it works out really well. So, you know, you can't go into being a YouTuber as YouTube being your only thing, if that makes sense. I kind of wish that was the case because it would be nice to be able to just focus on one thing, but that's not my reality. So yeah, I just have a very diverse revenue flow, I guess would be a, the right way to put it. Uh, but all in all, I really can't complain. And yeah, it's going well overall. Thank you for your concern though. I appreciate it. Okay, that'll pretty much do it for today's video. Thank you guys so much for the questions. Again, go check out the link to my Facebook page, the Carcosa Facebook group and the Discord server. Big thank you to everyone who watched this video and submitted questions. And an even bigger thank you once again to all my Patreon members whose names are on the screen at this point in time. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I'll see you over on Metal TikTok, I guess. And we'll talk next time.